Okay, okay. We're going to go ahead and get started here. I think most people will have arrived. There's a few more people coming up the stairs, so uh, they'll, be, they'll be dropping in. And I wanted to uh, give you a quick introduction. First of all, welcome to Northern Water. Thank you for taking the time to learn with us today. We're glad you're here. My name is Frank Kinder. I'm representing Northern Water's Efficiency Program, and we're your host. Our team consists of Lindsay Lucia, she's in the back there, Mary Hattendorf, and then uh, Chad Cannell. Ask us any questions you have about Northern or our program, and we're happy to help. In the very back, some flyers represent the different options that we're providing to our allottees. A couple of housekeeping pieces. There are restrooms down the hall. If for any reason we have to evacuate, just use this rear door here where we'll go downstairs and just gather in the outside turf. We have some great health food for you today. Seriously, folks, the donuts are delicious. I'm not kidding. Um, if you don't like that kind of health food, we also have some bananas and some cuties and things like that. It's Friday, so I think we should all indulge a little bit. If you're unfamiliar with the district, we are serving the territory of the Northern Front Range from the um, kind of the region of Fort Collins down to Boulder out to the state line. And we serve just under a million people and 640,000 acres of irrigated farmland. We do that with the Colorado Big Thompson Project, gathering water in Rocky Mountain National Park and moving it east. If you've never been to the interpretive model outside, it's a nice little model of that, that system with the reservoirs and the, and the um, different tunnels. So like all of you, we feel the pressures of growth and we're addressing it through multiple measures. Last year, Northern launched a, con launched a conservation program of services to assist our allottees or water users to use water wisely. And so this is what we're providing for those services. Water audits through, so through Slow to Flow by a partnership with Resource Central, outreach and education, which is our annual conservation fair, Satur Saturday, June 8th. And in the back, there's a flyer representing the fair. It's uh, nine to two, it's a really good time. It's free and there's lots of giveaways. I encourage you to come if you would like. Renovating our conservation gardens that, that are in the back. There's a flyer in the back and you'll see some changes over the next couple of years. We provide efficiency tools and there's a couple of flyers we've created around some of the findings in our previous studies. We do customer consultations and we provide uh, free objective analysis through those consultations and there's a flyer in the back that shows all of our services. Looks like this, it's kind of an overview. And then we're doing landscape conservation grants. A few of the grant participants are in the, in the room today. The consultations and grant conversations revealed an interest in and demand for native grass. But what we found was there was a gap in understanding how to do this successfully, which leads us to the last initiative, that's our industry training. So we're expanding our training beyond IA classes to things like this today. We wanna make sure that we try to get these native grasses in here successfully. So we brought you Eric Becker. He's the Special Districts Administrator from Colorado Springs Parks and Rec. And he is, as you might've seen in his bio on Eventbrite, he's highly credentialed, he's experienced, he's a former colleague of mine, and he's a good friend. So Eric's gonna share our agenda today and his story and methods for successfully establishing native stands. Finally, we're recording this webinar, and so we'll be taking some questions throughout for Eric, and then the webinar questions will occur at the end. As you may know, after the discussion today, there'll be a, an optional walk around with Eric to see some of the stands we have outside. Outside. With that, I'd like you to please help me welcome Eric Becker. All right, good morning. I am, uh, everybody hear me okay? I'm very excited uh, to be here. This is, uh, to me, a, a long time coming to see a room like this full of people who are interested in, in native grasses. It's more volume. Okay. You ever notice that I almost have to put this in my windpipe for it to... <laughs> is that any better? Not really? A little bit? I like to move around, so I'll, I'll try to do that. I think this will be all right. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm very excited to be here, especially so because my role at, at the Parks District in Colorado Springs has evolved over the last year, year and a half uh, to more of an administrative role. I don't get the, the fun part anymore of going out to the field 
like you're going to see here. But the last seven years, I've, I've been doing that a whole bunch and um, really enjoy getting out and, and working with these native grasses and these conversion projects. So my role has changed. Um, Jared, who I wanted to introduce to you, is, is in my role as water conservation specialist. Why don't you stand up, Jared? Because people may want to come talk to Jared during intermission or whatever. He's done a lot of great work with some herbicide stuff that I'm going to show you. Those are his slides, kind of his programs for the most part. But um, Jared gets to do the fun stuff now, and I kind of do the not so fun stuff, so to speak. But I wanted to, to share just a couple opening um, questions or ask a few questions of you guys. I want this to be interactive as much as we can. Um, trying to get a feel from where you are all from. So municipalities, who, how many in here work for a, a municipality? Okay, parks, parks, or any water purveyors here? A couple, okay. Any like conservation specialist type, you know, you're, you know, water conservation specialist types, good, a few. Um, contractors, you know, folks that are maybe looking to do some of these projects, a couple, okay. I know we have a few uh, seed, seed vendors here, is that right? I know I saw Don and Tyler from Granite. So yes, these guys will, will make reference to some seed here. Um, so the format today will be about 45, 50 minutes of me speaking, and then we're going to take about a 10 minute break and then another 45 or so minutes of just again, um, taking you through a series of projects and lessons learned from the last seven years. I've kind of been involved um, with about 40 different projects with our city parks department. I've met some of you on site and shown some of you in this room some of our work, but you know it's it's been you know an ongoing process of lessons learned, and I'm excited to share that with you guys. My goal today, we'll talk about in here in just a minute, but I really hope I can incite you, motivate you to take on some of these projects. I mean, it's not rocket science. There, there is some science to it, as you'll see, that's uh, important to know. And I want to try to pass along tools that I've learned to help you be successful with your project. So I look forward to doing that. I hope I hit the mark. Please, you know, if something is not clear, ask questions, clarification. We'll try to do that as much as possible. If we need to keep moving, I may hold more questions till, till later. So, um, so the projects that you're gonna see today are you know, all irrigated projects. I get a lot of questions about dryland grass seeding and you know, just so you know, this is all irrigated, okay? This is all conversions, either taken projects that are bluegrass I would say a lot of them are probably a combination of bluegrass and, and a lot of weeds, to be honest, um, from some of our park locations and converting that to native grasses. So that's kind of the process that I'm going to be outlining today, okay? So I know there's different processes that you can, can do, removals and kill and till, but that's, that's kind of a different deal. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear uh, up front. Um, so one more question and we'll start in. How many of you have tackled a conversion? How many of you have been involved with a conversion or two? Oh, good. I'd like to see that. Um, you know, again, we can share some of these lessons ourselves as we go along and talk. So let's, uh, let's do that. I'm glad there's some folks that have been involved with that. All right, so let's look at the objective. To broaden the understanding and use of native grasses as a landscape option, in a viable water conserving strategy, okay? So this is a great option. I'm not, I should have put great option up there, but it truly is. It's um, one that hasn't gotten, I think it's it, it due in terms of being introduced into our landscapes, um, but it's getting there. I feel like it's catching on, but it's still slow to catch on, especially this idea of going into old landscapes and converting like we're gonna talk about mostly today. So I forgot to tell you, I've got some, some uh, swag up here to give away. I like to interact a little bit. I gotta tell you that I'm kind of towards the bottom of my swag bag. So some of these are kind of, you may wanna re-swag them to somebody else. <laughs> so the first one is, this 
picture up here is a picture of our state grass. Who knows what our state grass is? There's, I like the hand back there. Blue grandma. Oh my word, you should get bonus points. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna toss this. So this is a, uh, a stress relief ball. Is that right? No. <laughs> and here we go, ready? All right. Blue grama, one of my favorite grasses that I've worked with. It's uh, uh, very adaptable to a variety of soils. Um, you know, just a, a real pretty grass. You can mow it, you can leave it grow tall. Just a lot of neat features uh, that grass has. One downside to blue grama, and we'll talk more about it, but herbicide uh, susceptibility. You got to be very careful which herbicide that you use with this grass. But Again, the objective today is to look at this as an alternative to some other landscape options. Okay, it's not, I'm not saying this is our, our only option for, you know, landscape treatment, but it is a very good option for uh, landscape treatment. All right, just real quick, an overview of kind of what I'll be taking you through today is I'm going to talk about the program background, how I got started and involved uh, with the program in, in Colorado Springs. We're gonna go through and spend the majority of the time going through the conversion process. I'll be doing a lot of detail on the actual process, um, short-term ma uh, maintenance and management, and long-term management, which is, to me, the key to success is, you know, seven years later, eight years later, 10 years later, what do these projects look like? So we'll do an overview of several projects. We'll look at some cost benefit. You know, at these, these projects pay for themselves very quickly. Um, the majority of them. And then we'll hopefully have some time, which we will, for some questions. So how did I get started? So Cara Springs, the economic downturn in 2008, 9, 10, we were really the, the government poster child for cutbacks. When you look at Cara Springs, the, the drastic draconian cut that they made within our parks district, within the city services, taking trash cans out because we didn't have staff that could actually empty the trash cans. Our water budget went way down. Our park budget was cut, you know, significantly. Well, what happened is the amount of water that we were able to purchase obviously went way down. So our, uh, our city council folks who also wear the hat of um, utilities board came to our utility company and says, what can you do to help parks? So, what they did is they created a program, a two-pronged program. One was a kind of a water budget program, parks water rate, a reduced water rate based on irrigated acreage and historic ET values. And then the other one was the one I was hired to, to do back in 2010, which is a parks efficiency program, meaning um, went in and we looked at all the irrigation systems, we did audits, looked for ways to improve the efficiency of the irrigation system. And as we began to do that, we started to look at, wow, there's a lot of area out of here that we're irrigating that doesn't really need to be irrigated. So what is another option for that? So that led to me developing what I call a comprehensive irrigation water management plan. This is a whole nother topic and discussion and presentation in itself. But I did want to show you the variety of factors that we are looking at and utilizing for our water management program in Colorado Springs. And if you look on the far left side there, it says water footprint reduction. And that's really what this is. This program that we're gonna talk about today is how can we reduce our water footprint? Um, and we've been doing it almost to about 100 acres, about 70, we've done about 75 acres of native grass um, since about 2012. So, All right, so how many of you have heard the, the Colorado Water Plan? Not all at once, no. A few of you, okay. It's a huge document. I encourage you to get the executive summary, but it's, it's a water plan for Colorado, water planners and um, various green industry folks took a very exhaustive look at our, you know, what's projecting out, what our population growth is gonna be like in 2050, what's our water source, you know, infinite water source gonna look, or finite water source gonna look like, so they see this big gap as you look out. I mean, in Colorado Springs alone, I know, I'd heard the other day that our growth is supposed to go up by 500,000 people in 10 years, which I can't fathom that. Um, so 
anyway, there's this gap in, in, this, um, in this plan that they show, and how are they going to bridge that gap? You know, 400,000 acre feet is by conservation. So these, these ideas of projects like this, ways to uh, be better stewards of our water, okay, but at the same time trying to keep these attractive landscapes. So here's uh, Cutler Hall, Colorado College. If you've been in the springs, this is a real pretty part of uh, Colorado Springs. And it's kind of a neat picture. I'm trying to make a, make a point here, but kind of look at that front door. You can see the front door in the building there, 1882. And um, what do you notice in this picture? No trees. <laughs> yeah, so here's fast forward at 2015, right? So you have this built environment, this environment that we live in now that we introduce certain aspects into it. Plants, right? Grass plants, trees, um, majority of them, obviously, when you look at this picture, there's not a whole lot of trees on the front range of Colorado, right? That are native trees that have stood the test of time. So we, we introduce into our environment, these introduced species that, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, but you know, some are good, some aren't so good. Some, you know, stand the test of time. But one thing, when you look at native grasses and the grassland that we live on, I mean, they've been here. When you, I'll go into more of this, but when you look at the grasslands of Colorado, I mean, they've been here. And a lot of the grasses that we are using, we're reintroducing back into some of our landscapes that were, you know, here forever. That's kind of the idea. All right, so for some more valuable swag here. What are some advantages of native grasses when you compare them to bluegrass? So bluegrass is our grass, right? Everything's bluegrass, you know, and I, I, my background is golf course superintendent for 25, well, not totally for 20, golf course groundskeeper for 25 years. Um, I'm a bluegrass fan with the right place, you know, it, it's great grass, you can't beat it on a sports field can't beat that type of grass but it's not the grass choice for everywhere it takes a lot of maintenance a lot of water a lot of fertility to keep it looking good so what what are some of the advantage of native grass over bluegrass uses less water good drought resistant yeah it's again stands the test here's the, i don't know what this is some kind of jelly pack it's a mouth put it to good use so drought tolerance, less water, what else? What's that? Yeah, more adaptive to, to I would say, crummy soils, you know, just soils that uh, you don't have to have the right kind of organic matter or, you know, pore space and, you know, just very adaptive to a variety of soils. Good. Warm temperatures, right? Hot, you know, the warm season grasses thrive. When it gets warm, disease resistance, insects. I should be throwing them. I don't want to use it all up here. <laughs> Who said disease resistance? Okay. Um, <laughs> so here's a list. We talked about these. Reduced maintenance is one that I we're gonna you're gonna see. I mean, it's one that we you can really recoup your your money investment on your projects very quickly just with maintenance alone in terms of depending on what you're going to do what type of grass but um, so more resistant to pests we talked about heat and drought not invasive right it doesn't it's not one of those grasses that'll crowd out other grasses they kind of get along i say they play well together type of thing um, and then they're sustainable like the buzzword right they stand the test of time how about on the flip side okay I'm always asked about the miracle grass, the grass that looks like bluegrass, smells like bluegrass, feels like bluegrass, but doesn't use, you know, the water that bluegrass does. No such thing, right? So what are some disadvantages of when you look at it in terms of native grasses compared to bluegrass? Stress on homeowners. Stress on home? What do you mean by that? Dormancy. Oh, dormancy. Okay. It depends on what type of natives you use. If you use cool season natives, you know, they very they pretty much mimic the growing season of of uh, bluegrass. Good. Don't form a turf. Don't form a turf. 
Right. Yeah, you're not going to get that thick turf look like Kentucky bluegrass, a rhizominous grass, dense. Yep. Just non-invasive. Non-invasive. Well, bluegrass can be kind of, yeah, can be kind of invasive. Okay, yeah, exactly. Do I have another one? Right. Yeah, it doesn't green up as quick. Okay. It definitely depends on what kind of mix you use. If it's warm and cool season like we use, um, we've had good luck with, I mean, we had green grass in March at several of our sites this year. It's been pretty, pretty cool to see. So we'll flip through these. Not as dense and thick. We talked about that. Doesn't hold up well. This is an important one. Foot traffic, you know, it doesn't hold up well to, you're not going to put this on a playing field, right? Question? Shade, correct. Yeah, there's only, really, I've only found, if you have a heavy shade area, fine fescue is the only thing I have found that works well in a, in a um, setting or an exposure like, like that. Let's see, so it can be uh, challenging to establish from seed. We actually haven't found that. I mean, native grasses, uh, literally within a year, we've got it down to where we can get a great native stand within, within a year. Um, not available in sod form, right? You're not going to go get a, a couple rolls of your uh, little blue stem at your um, Home Depot. That's not out there yet. So here's some of the list. What's that? Yeah, they tend to be more of a problem in, in native grasses. I would agree just because there's more soil exposed, right? I mean, we think about density. That was one of the things that came up. But we have a pretty good program that we've outlined. And overall, we've done a, I'd say there's some, some key things that I'll go over that will help you in that um, weed control aspect. So, all right, so let's step through what the conversion process is. There's some, um, what I would call some general categories that I'll, I'll work through with you guys. So identifying areas for conversion, looking at site conditions, right? What type of soil and, shade and slope and topography, grass selection we'll spend quite a bit of time on, the conversion method we'll spend a fair amount of time on, the establishment process, okay, break it down into irrigation, mowing, and weed control, and then long-term maintenance, and then the cost benefit. So these are the categories I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover for us. Question? Tougher to establish? Yeah, that was, well, that was up there. The C can be, and I, um, again, I, I would agree somewhat, but I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to try to give you some tools to be successful. I, I feel like they've been easier than I expected because I grew, you know, I kind of started with that idea in mind that they were going to be really tough. But literally within a year, you'll, I'll show you some pictures. We've been pretty successful in trying to, you know, getting a stand in a, in a, in a year, so. Yeah. When you get a question, would you mind repeating it just for the folks on the line? Okay, gotcha. Thank you. All right, low use conventional turf. So identifying areas when you look at your site, whether it's an HOA, a park district, school district, your house, whatever, areas that they're good um, potential areas to convert. This is one where we probably have our greatest uh, areas of of conversion in are these what we call low use conventional turf areas areas that are you know the old design for a park was a massive expanse of bluegrass across the entire park um, so we're finding that some of the peripheral areas outside sidewalk areas um, we've been converting some of these areas but here's a list of them you kind of have to kind of go through your checklist yourself Restricted access turf, you know, areas along roadways. So we have probably six or seven different projects where we've done uh, medians, a couple acres of medians actually, um, that I think is a, a very good option. I mean, when you think about driving by in a car going 45 miles an hour, you know, no one's gonna know if it's bluegrass or if it's wheatgrass, really. Heavy shade areas, you know, that's 
they're a challenge. I mean, there's not a whole lot of options. But looking at some of your problem maintenance areas and trying to identify why it's a problem maintenance area, south facing slope or whatever, you know, important to kind of look at some of those areas as well. So existing site condition evaluation, really important. First bullet is, is really important. You have to define your expectation. To be successful, you know, you, the person in the conversion, uh, is the only one that's really going to be able to answer that. So you have to go through the process in your mind and ask yourself a lot of questions on, you know, what are your expectations? Is it going to supposed to look green year round or green during the growing season like bluegrass? Are you okay with it being dormant? Do you want to mow it? Do you want to water it? You know, there's a series of questions that you have to ask. You know, if you just put in a, a stand of grass and it's, um, not what you expected because you didn't do some homework. It's just really important to kind of define your expectation and what you're able to do maintenance wise up front. Irrigation, do you want to irrigate it? Do you have to change irrigation? You're going to see we've had to, in a lot of our projects, you know, change the zoning up to accommodate some of the things that we were doing. Okay, so this is one of our biggest costs in the conversion process. You know, when you have a park that's you know, all zoned to run together in terms of bluegrass, and we were going to come in and we're going to change the zones up so we can take advantage of the water savings of the native grass. That requires some changing of different things. So, the soil you need to look at, topography, exposure, trees. This is an important one. You have to kind of look at your site, um, look at the amount of water that was going down on that site. What are those trees used to getting when you do a, a conversion? Um, a lot of our sites weren't used to a lot of water, to be perfectly honest. But, you know, if you have a site that's used to getting 30 inches of water, a bluegrass, and you're going to put in a, you know, a midgrass prairie native grass that's going to get 12 inches, you need to, you know, account for that on your drip irrigation for trees. Okay, put that in to consideration. So important to do that up front. The trees will suffer. A natural border. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. So here's the park. Hopefully you can see it pretty well. There's a sidewalk going horizontally across the top. Everything above that is, uh, was an area that we converted at a, at a park. It's a hill. I'll show you here in just a second, a street view. And then the lower right corner is another sidewalk cutting across. That, that area was converted. So um, we had to change irrigation around top left corner. There's a sidewalk going straight up and down there vertically. The irrigation used to run all the way across from the street all the way across. So we basically got it to where now just the left side of the sidewalk is bluegrass and then everything else. Um, and that's kind of what I'm talking about borders. If you have sidewalks, you have natural areas to work from where you can look and say, oh, wow, you know, to start a, a, a native project right in the middle of a, uh, you know, of a turf area without a natural border doesn't work well, in my opinion. So here's that same park. You can see again, up above to the right of the sidewalk is the area that we were converting, a hill, a slope, high maintenance area that, you know, had no business really being bluegrass. All right, grass selection. Let's, uh, let's talk about that. We're going to spend a fair amount of time on grass selection. I think it's, it's important to, to, again, when you define your expectations, you know, this is when you pick the grass that you're hopefully going to manage and maintain, and you want it to be the kind of grass that you can have success with. So intended use of the grass, okay, very important. Desired quality level. Are you willing to mow it? take care of it, you know, how much are you willing to put into it maintenance-wise? Um, I'll step you through all those different questions. Here's a picture of, you know, a fine fescue, again, uh, mode and unmode, kind of a neat little transition there. All right, so let's talk about a couple of quick terms before we, because it, it, to me there's kind of a, a misunderstanding in a sense of native grasses and versus introduced grasses. And I, I kind of already talked about this, but you know, native grasses have stood the test of time. They're when you walk out into a field and you know, kind of just stroll through, you'll see these grasses that have lived here a long time and have you know, basically stood up against what mother nature has thrown against. So introduced species now, on the other hand, are 
or plants that have been brought in either by man or some other means, um, intentionally or not intentionally. And some of them are good. I'm not going to say that they're not. We use a couple introduced um, grass species, but you know, think about some of the stuff that's been introduced, either you know, trees or grasses that aren't so good. You think of like elm trees or you know, people take aspens from its home up at eight, 9,000 feet and try to grow them you know, in an urban environment. It just doesn't work. They're introducing. So you have to be careful in what introduced grasses, I believe, that you use. I've got a list of, of some that I would say you'd want to stay away from in my experience. Um, but there are some good introduced grasses. We try to stick strictly with native grasses for the most part. We're very much purist, right, Jared? Um, no, not really. Um, so here's some, some resources. We, I mentioned we've got two um, seed vendors here that this is their life. They can help you. You don't need to get into this nerdy stuff. I kind of like it. And I, you know, I just wanted to make reference to some resources that are out there that if you want to look into finding out what's native in your area, um, NRCS, the USDA website, has a great, I would write this down, it's, it's a very exhaustive website that has a lot of information. So down in kind of in almost in the middle, the dark green area is El Paso County. And the northern part of El Paso County, northern and central, is kind of considered a Rocky Mountain foothill type um, environment. And then the south part is more of a, you know, I call it a banana belt hotter and drier type of thing. So, you know, you can play around with it, put different grasses, find out what's native. So this is uh, blue grama. The, the green means that it's native in that county. Um, the white means that it's either absent or hasn't been reported. So, you know, you can look at different grasses and come up with your own list. But here's like some of the major grasses, um, subdominant grasses, and then some other minor grasses that when you walk a field in Colorado Springs that's a native field, this is what, what you're going to find. So, again, blue grama and western wheat, we pretty much use in all of our, our mixes. And then green needle, we use quite a bit. Side oats, almost you know, always in our mix. Um, we're looking to try some mountain muley this year. But these are, these are grasses that are, should work well in our area, and they have. Here's some to stay away from, in my opinion. Just, uh, I thought I'd, you know, they kind of get thrown in sometimes into a mix. I would say it's, it's thrown around as native or low grow or try this or, and yeah, for ground cover, or again, whatever, you have to define what your expectation is. You know, this might work fine if you're just trying to, um, you know, prevent erosion in a, in, a, in a ditch or something like that. But as far as a, a pure native grass stand, I would stay away from these. They can be invasive. Um, you know, the smooth brome and the crested wheatgrass, you know, those are ones that um, to me are very uh, challenging to, um, you know, you can't really include this in a native. They just kind of take over. They're very aggressive grass. Yeah. I have a question about the orange versus cool Uh huh. Yeah, so the question was about mixing cool season and warm season grasses, which is a great question. I appreciate you bringing that up. I meant to talk about this earlier. So um, everyone kind of understands generally cool season tends to, you know, it, it greens up this time of year or even earlier. Like I said, we had green grass in March. Cool season grasses tend to kind of struggle in the, in the summertime when it gets hot. You know, they kind of go dormant sometimes, depending on how much you water them. Warm season grasses thrive on the other hand. So they start to green up here about now and usually by the end of May, they're, they're, they're doing well. Soil temperatures have to come up and then they go dormant, you know, first frost that we have. So shorter growing season for warm season. Uh, to answer your question pretty quickly here, our ideal mix has both of them mixed into it. Um, we mix in cool and warm season just for that reason. I mean, we have identified our expectation in the parks and in our community is that we wouldn't have a brown stand of grass, you know, until the end of May. We drove by a, a site that had buffalo grass a couple weeks ago. Well, it was about a week ago, actually. It was still just pure brown. And 
you have to define that as the end user. I can't define that for you. You guys have to define that's part of the expectation. But as far as chemical, going back to your, your question, I think we have some things that could help you. I mean, you're right. You have to be careful which ones you, you um, which herbicides that you use, and you're going to be definitely limited compared to a cool season stand um, or even just a strictly warm season stand. But I, I think we can help with some of those uh, herbicides that you'll find that you can use. So here's a, a question for a really cool pair of sunglasses here. Um, Hard fescue, sheep fescue, blue fescue, and creeping rent is an example of what? What's that? It's a fine fescue, but is that a seed blend or is that a seed mix? Who said blend? All right. You might like these. <laughs> but it's not as good. Oh, okay. Um, so seed blend, seed mix, you know, understanding the difference between those two is important. I mean, a blend is using the same, um, you know, pretty much the same type of species and mixing some different types of cultivars or varieties. A seed mix is when you, you introduce a, a variety of um, species. So you got warm season, cool season, that would be an example of a mix. All right, so let's go on here. More grass stuff, seed stuff. Midgrass prairie. Here's one that we've used at a couple different locations. Again, a, a mix of warm and cool season grasses. Um, this is very low maintenance. These are areas that we only mow a couple times. It's made to get tall. Um, it's not necessarily made to be a turf, turf type look to it, um, at least the way we're using it. So this is a this is an example of of one of our our mixes. Here's an example of the site that we used to that. Just to show you, I think it's helpful to see some some of these sites that we're um, using them in. So when you look at this park, you can see uh, kind of on the left side there, it's Wildflower Park. That's the site that we converted. All the way up to the right of that, you can see a sidewalk around. That's all considered the park. So this site was really um, very passive use. There was really no activity going on in this area. And this is a site that we decided to, to use it in. So here's Midgrass Prairie, five weeks after seeding. I mean, it's truly, it came in uh, exceptional. It's one of my favorite sites that we've converted. It's doing really well. Wheatgrass blend. Um, I call this kind of our, our bluegrass. Uh, you know, blend more or less. We've kind of changed this up over time and I'll show you here in a minute, I think what I'd consider to be a better mix. This is a blend of just wheat grasses that we've used, one to consider. We've done a lot of sites with this. So here's our flagship or one of our flagship parks here in Colorado Springs uh, Memorial. If you look down at the lower right, right there, those are a couple of conversion sites that you'll see on the next slide. So this is taken from a hot air balloon, actually. Right past the, the bell tower there, that area was converted a few weeks, or I'm sorry, a few, several weeks before. And then the area that's right there in the dirt, it was just recently uh, seeded. So that's what those pictures are. And then here's a couple pictures, seeded July 1st. And you can see by the end of August, September, you've got a, a good stand of, of grass. All right, so here's the ones I'm most excited about. Again, these have, are over seven years of testing different things, looking at stuff that we like, we don't like, herbicides, you know, how do they respond to herbicides? You know, we're, we're always trying different stuff, you know, test areas and see how they respond to different things. Um, the mix on top is one that I'm, I'm really excited about. It's got blue grama, so it's going to give you a little more, a few more limitations on which herbicides you can use. but it's one that I'm excited to try. And then the bottom one there is one that um, we've used quite a bit. Um, if you look at the side oats grama in the Rocky Mountain fescue. We have found those to be a, a very nice addition to the wheat grasses and really form a, a pretty nice turf overall. 
All right, I'm going to step you through this conversion process, and then we'll we'll probably take a break here right after that. So initiate conversion when vegetation is actively growing May 1st through September 1st. Okay, folks would, you know, some folks would say, you know, September 1st is too late. We have pushed the envelope a lot on our seeding dates, and I'm not saying to do that, but I'm saying we do it. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's been very successful with it. We've actually seeded after September. And what you notice sometimes is you get the grass come up. You, you try to shoot for that secondary root system to establish before it goes into winter. Um, otherwise, it could end up desiccating and dying. But we haven't seen that. Usually, we have enough of a nice fall. But, you know, you never know. You roll the dice sometimes. But what we noticed, especially this year, we did a very late conversion. I don't know when we seed the one in Midshook. It was, might have been even in October. <laughs> it was late September. And it came up pretty good. And then this spring, it just like, I mean, it just really came in. So I'm not saying do that. I'm saying if I'm going to pick a, a date or a, a month that I, I personally like to do these projects, I'm picking July, actually. Um, you know, leading up to it, the soil temperatures are nice and warm in July. We have some monsoon rains that we can take advantage of, which help. Um, and then the weeds start to kind of wane down, you know, starting, it's probably late August, but, you know, at least you're headed the right way with the, with the weed uh, pressure. All right, so this, this uh, treat, so yeah, actively, when the vegetation is actively grown, and then um, we've been treating, uh, the area that we convert the large areas with with uh, glyphosate, um, two to three ounce rate. Uh, what people don't understand a lot of times with these conversions that you know you don't want to shut the water off actively growing. In case for herbicides to work, you, you need to have that uptake. They need to be actively growing, otherwise they go dormant. And what happens through the process when you start to establish them? If you're not watering them and you start watering them, even more weeds come up. So you want to make sure you're irrigating the area that you're going to convert, um, if you can. And then even after you apply your glyphosate, you know, wait your 24 hours or whatever, but then keep watering. You want stuff to keep growing as much as you can. And then you come back with the, with the second application of glyphosate. So... And I don't know if you guys are experiencing the, some of the pressures we do down in the spring, but, you know, glyphosate has become a bad word in a lot of communities. Um, we get some pressure from some folks who have the ear of our city council, and we're looking to, I mean, we, I feel like we're very responsible users, obviously, of our, of our herbicides. We're not a herbicide maniac. They have a place when you use them properly according to the label and apply them the right way. And, um, but we're looking at, I'll show you, Jared put together a slide that has some alternatives to glyphosate. Um, we're going to try it this year and see how they work. Um, my experience so far early on is, you know, they tend to burn, you know, the leaf. They're more of a contact uh, herbicide that, you know, you can get some quick dye back. It looks like it's dead, but it doesn't get the root and a lot of it comes back. We tried a test area last year in, a, in an area and that's what happened. And, we still have it kind of, um, you know, so-called marked off, and we're, we're kind of treating that area differently than, than the rest of the park. So anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because we are looking at some alternative uh, type herbicides to glyphosate. That's per thousand gallons, two, three gallons. Per thousand square feet, yeah. Mow area as short as possible. So basically, at this point, everything's dead. I did put in here include a not a uh, a herbicide beside glyphosate. Um, a lot of times, if you have a very weedy site, um, it helps. You know, the process. You know, helps aid the process in killing what's there. The grass dies pretty quick, actually. The weeds sometimes hang on, and by tank mixing just kind of a you know a you know two four D product or something like that in there. At least on the first application, there's a seeding, um, a reseeding date that you have to be careful of when you do herbicides. You know, glyphosate, that's one of the beauties of it. You can apply it and seed pretty quickly afterwards. Some of the herbicides are a couple weeks, so you need to be, be careful and read the label on that. Um, 
So mow the area as short as you can, flag stuff, because you're going to be running equipment over it, right? Cedars and aerators and anything you don't want damaged. Um, we core aerate, you know, as much as you can. You want to try to create a couple different things with the aerate. And obviously holes for the seed to fall into that are going to, I think, improvements to us have been a very good environment for germination of seed. And then it also brings some soil up on top, depending on your, your situation. It's nice to have that soil that when you drag it, it becomes almost like a top dressing. So core aerate several times, several different directions. And then we broadcast seed. Before we drill seed, we broadcast it, okay? A um, couple different methods we've used for that. I've hand sown a lot of grass seed over the years. Um, we have a couple spreaders that I'll show you pictures of that we use. Um, we haven't found a real good way to do a large area. Um, we used to use something called a Bicon spreader on the golf course, and that seems to work pretty good. Um, and then we drill seed or slit seed or any way you can get seed cut into the ground to a quarter inch to a half inch um, is ideal. Okay, that's where we've seen the best germination with these projects. If you can get that grass seed, I say drill because that's kind of the best situation down to that quarter to a half inch, um, it germinates really well. Um, so that's, that's the drill seed. We've used a variety of seeders, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Drag the area thoroughly, apply hydro mulch and erosion netting control fabric. So this is one of the things I get a lot of questions on, how much do you use? And, uh, you know, to be honest, we don't use a lot of, of the, you know, the erosion control stuff. So Hydro mulch, and here an application for us is an area that you can't um, get a drill seeder on. So some of our medians and some tight areas on hills and things like that, um, where you can't get a drill seeder on, um, we tend to use hydro mulch to hold, you know, we, you put the seed down, broadcast, you rake it in, and to give it some extra cover, mimicking kind of that quarter inch, we have found that it definitely helps in germination when you put it on top of a bare soil application. Now, if you drill seed it, there's no really reason to do it unless it's on a hill. So, you know, the other application is on a hill, you know, a steeper hill where you're trying to hold the soil from eroding away, you know, that would be another application to use it. And then organic fertilizer. I'm a huge fan of organic fertilizers. Over the last couple of years, uh, Jared and I have been doing a lot of work with these and just seeing how things react to, to fertilizers and dry pol uh, DPW, dry poultry waste. We were thinking there might be some chicken farms around here. We can grab some on our way back. <laughs> that wouldn't be a nice play. That wouldn't be a nice ride home. <laughs> um, methylene ureas, neutraline, those are a couple of ones that we're looking uh, to use. But yeah, organic fertilizer is just a nice, slow, steady feeding. You'll get a flush growth. Um, great stuff. Irrigate. So that's kind of the, the process there. Again, there's lots of variations to this. And I'll just say any way you can get that seed down on the ground to that quarter to a half inch is the best way to do it. So um, this is one process uh, that we use. So question? Yeah, that's a good question. So this is dependent on the grass that we're, we're, we're um, using, the, you know, the mix or the variety. I would agree somewhat on the, the mid-grass prairie. I think it helps with establishment, to be honest. I, I do. You have that nitrogen source right there. The seeds really are just starting out. So I would say it aids in establishment would be the biggest reason that we do it. Um, the midgrass prairie, we don't fertilize at all once it's established. Just like you say, it, it, it adapts perfect. You know, some of the other mixes that we're using, we do fertilize. You'll see the maintenance plan that we have. Good question. Yeah, good question on amending soil. Um, I'll talk about that here in just a second. Okay. Um, so here's the, the glyphosate alternatives I mentioned. Um, I think the one on top, Finale, is the one that got the best reviews so far that we're going to be trying. But again, depending on your community and all that, this is something, you know, give it a shot and try and 
heck, report back. We, we're going to be trying these this year, so um, hopefully we have some, some good results. A couple pictures of cedars that we use, again, the, the top right, actually, broadcast. You know, I have a hard time finding a cedar because, you know, native grass seed is so large um, or can be large, it's hard to fit through a traditional, um, you know, spreader. So we've kind of found one that works for us. You know, the drill cedar on the left is one that we use quite a bit. It's got three inch spacing. So one point I wanted to make that I think is really important, at least for us, in terms of what were our end results, we have kind of exceeded um, seeding rates that when you open up the textbook and you see 30, um, 30 pounds of pure live seed per acre or 90 you know, pounds of pure live seed per acre, um, we're after a denser stand, and you know the question came up about fertilizer. Um, we have found that by having a denser stand and fertilizing it, I'm not saying we're pushing it, we're using a slow release fertilizer, you know we're accomplishing what I'd consider a very nice look, and we're able to still save money on mowing and watering and all those different types of things. So that's kind of our compromise. We've the seeding rates, the denser stands really help, I believe, with weed control and overall appearance. Again, it depends on what you're after. If you're looking for just some type of midgrass prairie that, you know, you mow twice a year, you don't have to do that. But one of the things that we've learned, we really like the look of a denser stand, and we're willing to kind of maintain it that way as well. All right, why don't we go ahead and take a 10-minute break and we'll come back and we'll start in on uh, the establishment irrigation piece. <clears throat> All right, let's let's grab our seats here. We'll get started again. Oh, good. I wanted to answer a, a question that was brought up um, about amendments in soil. I think it's it's an important question. I. You know, when you look at native grasses, and this has been brought up, that, you know, their ability to adapt to a variety of soils is one of the major benefits of that. So um, we have yet to amend the soil. We have 40 projects or more. We haven't done anything to amend the soil. We do take a soil test. We kind of get a feel for, you know, if you have a non-pot site, you might, you know, if you, you suspect issues with, salt or things like that, maybe a different story. But when you look at the soils that we've used, I mean, they've all worked great. One exception, I will say that, you know, one of the few projects, we've had probably two projects that um, didn't work out in, in sections for a reason or two, and that, that came back to soil compaction. The structure of the soil was the issue. And I would say if you have it, you suspect something that, uh, you know, compaction wise, this was on a construction project at Memorial Park. They, they put the velodrome over the, and they were driving heavy equipment. They actually dissed it, at least some of it, but there's still evidence of just some, you know, the structure of the soil was destroyed, the oxygen in the soil, you know, it, it just, it's struggling, it's doing okay, but you know, I, I go back to, you don't have to add soil amendments to these, uh, to the majority of these projects um, is our experience. And that's one of the beauties of using this native grass. So, question. Yeah. Well, there's, that would be more of a like a riparian type mix or a wet site mix that our seed vendors could probably help you find. But yeah, that wouldn't be a, necessarily a good site to use some of the grasses that I'm I'm talking about here. Um, but I'm sure we could come up with a mix of some kind. Yeah. 
So here's establishment irrigation. Um, I'm not going to step through all this. I know it's a lot. I don't, it's a ton. But the idea behind establishment irrigation is you're following the kind of what mimicking what the roots are doing. So you start out, you seed it. Obviously, the, you know, your seeds are down a quarter inch. No reason to put down lots of water because you're just trying to water to that top layer where the seed is. Over time, I've kind of broken it out into different phases kind of that we follow. You see germination, the root goes down, okay? You kind of cut back on the frequency, increase the duration, so you're starting to water deeper, okay, is the idea. So that's kind of a general plan. One of the most important things, I think, when you're establishing these grasses is you got to be out there looking at what's going on. Um, you know, irrigation problems occur all the time, and you know, you have to look at the plants, you have to look if there's any puddling going on and things like that. Mostly it's just being out there, being available to kind of see um, what's going on on the site. So one thing I, I get a lot of questions or some questions about, you know, these projects to establish these native grasses, again, don't take any more water than what we're watering the bluegrass. In fact, within a few weeks, they're taking less water already to establish. So it's not like, oh, we're going to, you know, seed and use a lot more water to establish these grasses. That's, that's not true. All right, so here's a couple of the conversion sites we'll, we'll go through fairly quickly. Keller Park, the top two are large sites. So I was told when I started this out, this idea back in 2012, you know, so you might want to start small and pick a few sites in case it doesn't work out. So what did I do? I started with our largest site, the record, seven and a half acre. <laughs> and said, I'll start there. So we did Watson Park and Keller at the same time in 2012. A couple of the smaller sites that I think would probably speak closer to maybe some people with HOAs or potentially we used a little different means. I can tell you that we don't do too many of these types of projects that I'm going to show you. We've done a few. This is a different way of removal of some of the stuff that we did. The majority of them are kind of like the top two. Um, so here's Watson Park. If you're familiar with the springs at all, there was a high school there that closed down here in the last few years. Large site, it was over 12 acres. There's a baseball field. Um, there's a, a, a basketball court kind of the top there, that white area. And then we left an area for bluegrass. Um, it's kind of a nice flat play area, but if you look around that, that darker, or I guess it's lighter green, that's the conversion area that we, you'll see a picture of. To the right of the conversion area, and if you can see it, there's like an X there, like a blue red X. That's where this next slide's taken from. But again, we tried to use borders of so the sidewalk, the field, natural border areas to kind of division off and delineate. This is the native area, this is the bluegrass area. So a picture of, again, street view looking to the west. Keller Park, probably my favorite one maybe. Um, large site again, big big park, 17 acres. You know, it has a plain field down on the right side there where the name is, and then baseball field, playground, great spot for bluegrass, a lot of activity. When you get to the back part of this park, you know, with a hill going up, um, you really can't access that that part of the of the park. There's a fence that um, homeowners that butt up against it, so it's not like people are coming through there. So Again, we looked at this back in 2012, and it's like, why are we irrigating all this area that's not being used? So we converted that. So here's a picture, again, looking back again to the west. Um, November, some of the warm season grasses have gone dormant. They're beginning to go dormant, and nice contrast. Two other, probably, well, here's the next one, Barnes Meeting, right across from Switchbacks, and I guess it's the old Sky Sox. I don't know what their, their new nickname is. but question we'll get that yep so median small about a half, uh, almost a half acre 0. 0.4 I think it was again this is a different means of us doing it we we didn't use any type of um, glyphosate to, we manually removed it because the, the uh, median was crowned and so we wanted to take the soil level down Next area is a right-of-way area along the streetscape, um, kind of the right side of the screen. I don't know if you can see the red outline there. Another 
about point four. This was one of the more difficult sites, very steep hill. Um, that was actually being maintained as bluegrass. Uh, so those are the, the sites. So we'll step you through the, the process here. Irrigation modification, okay? Again, changing the zones to accommodate you, the, the new native areas versus the bluegrass areas. You know, a lot of times if there's spray head, um, pop-up sprays, we change them out to a six inch pop-up because we're gonna be mowing this higher. We use different types of uh, nozzles. We use MP rotator nozzles, put down water at a slower, slower rate, not impacted by, by wind. Um, just a really good nozzle. So we make modifications, you know, to our irrigation systems to accommodate what we're doing with the native grass. Again, vegetation removal, the two top two projects were glyphosate two applications. Um, it, you know, pretty much took out. Keller had a lot more bluegrass in it than Wasson. Wasson was, I would say, mostly weed, to be honest. Um, the one on the bottom right there, that the steep hill that I showed you, learned a lesson on, on that project that um, we used a sod cutter. The, the con we actually contracted it out uh, because it was so steep. He used a sod cutter and a skid steer to push it down. We didn't use glyphosate. If I'd do it over, I'd use it just because um, there was bluegrass on that. We did this in 2012. I think two years ago was the first year I couldn't find any bluegrass on it. It took there was this grass, bluegrass comes back because it's so you know, vigorous, rhizominous. So we ended up finding some sections of bluegrass. So I personally, I like the idea of just starting with the, with the clean slate. Seeding, um, use a large drill seeder, which we don't use anymore in that top picture. That's really a, an ag machine there. I mean, it's a great machine, but you know, when you're looking at smaller areas, taking that thing over it, you know, this was seven and a half acres, so it worked for us, but the majority of our sites are one, two, three acre type sites, and that just won't work in a lot of them. Um, so yeah, seeding methods there, dragging it in with, uh, with the drag mat that I told you we use on the back of a four-wheeler or a tractor or something like that to kind of get that um, seed mixed in. And then here's a couple of things that are important. Fertilizer, I mentioned, erosion control. So here's some straw netting on a hill that you know, that Wasson that we used, that steep right away area there in Briargate, you know, again used it. And those were the only two spots that we felt it was necessary. Didn't use any hydro mulch. And then signage. I think this is an important one. Uh, communication. You know, depending on your uh, area that you're doing this in, whether it's a city park or an HOA, getting the word out to help people understand what's going to happen on the front end, right? Um, so we've gotten a lot better about this. You know, we have signs out there. We try to get mailers sometimes if we can find a community like this picture here, or this uh, this is a little postcard mailer that went out to the residents on a median uh, down. It was actually downtown Colorado Springs, um, and tells them what's going on. You know, this is what you can expect, and this is why we're doing it. Um, and it was very well received, actually. We had a lot of nice, uh, actually, compliments about the process and how it turned out and all that. So communication is very important, front end and, you know, during, afterwards, while you're doing it. Here's some, uh, just a picture of the fertilizer going down. Establishment weed control. So a lot of questions about weed control. I've gotten, we've gotten a lot better just about this whole process. I was very gun shy early on about using any type of herbicide, tried to do some research and found some stuff and I used it, didn't really care for it, learned some lessons on what not to use. <laughs> um, but this is early on, pigweed, you know, was coming in thick, it didn't want to use herbicide, so we kind of just mowed it down and Thankfully, it, it worked pretty well. We had to come back and reseed some stuff initially, but we've gotten a lot better about this establishment process, and we're going to share these ideas with, with you guys. So, establishment weed control. Um, you know, sometimes we mow them. It depends on the application that you're trying to do, but you know, by mowing it, it keeps the, you know you can increase your density, light penetration, helps establish. Um, some of the grasses that come in. If you're not going to be using herbicides, you definitely want to be doing this, right? Mowing. Um, 
helps control some of the annual weeds, three to four inch lightweight equipment. So, and then here's a, what I consider our go-to application about five or six weeks after germination has occurred, grass is up. Um, this stuff has been just dynamite for us in terms of, you know, weeds are obviously very succulent, susceptible at this stage. And it's amazing to see one application done well will wipe out all the weeds, really. And you have this pure stand of grass that, so here's a, an example of this. Um, so August 17th, so this park was seeded in July um, 23rd. And by the end of end of August, I mean you can see it was it was pretty much a pure stand of grass. Um, so here's long-term management. This is midgrass prairie. Okay, so this is that combination of warm season, cool season grasses. What we'd consider to seed question. This is this is what we'd consider to be minimal question. <laughs> For a price. No, just price. Yes, I'll be happy to share slides. Yes. Deal. So, when you were mowing, was that your personal equipment that you guys were taking care of? I, I do have some concerns when we talk about mowing. Yeah. Like if it's your equipment, you can control it. You know where it's been, where it hasn't been, where it's not been. Yeah. The thing is, if you are contracting stuff out, I, I get real nervous about mowing. Uh huh. Yeah, so a question about who's doing the work, who's doing the mowing for these projects. And I'm glad she asked it because I didn't mention that we do a lot of the work ourselves. We contract out some. We're definitely very involved in everything that's going on. So we're making sure that stuff gets done the way we want if we do contract. Majority of all of our stuff now is all contract mode and what is in our city park. So um, contractors would be doing all the mowing again with with oversight but um, again we work with the contractors we use a lot of the same contractors they kind of know the routine by now type of thing and um, you know whoever you have doing these projects and I'll speak to this several times and, and certainly at the end that you've got to find somebody who's gonna want these projects to succeed you know you got to find someone who's passionate um, Resilient, um, wants to see them succeed, I think is really the key. Uh huh. Yeah. So you're, if I heard your question right, you're basically saying that you can't get the product, the herbicide to apply like you want and you can't find a contractor to do it for you? Yeah. It's not a restricted use herbicide, pesticide. Commercial properties. So are you talking residential or HOA would be commercial? No. Per Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I still think maybe a contractor would be your best bet. That, uh, I don't know. Maybe, Jared, afterwards you guys can chat a little bit. Sorry. We, we can talk more about it a little later. Um, this is really important here. I mean, this long-term management to me is really what you're after. I mean, I was determined not to allow these projects that we're doing. People were, oh, what is this turf the weed project and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I was very determined to make these um, successful and successful long-term. Jared's done a great job taking the ball and run with it. But uh, these are some of the key things that I see. Again, Midgrass Prairie. Um, these are sites where we're allowing the grass to kind of grow up. You know, these are lower maintenance sites. Um, we have about, these are uh, only six or seven projects. These are typically big projects, seven, eight acre sites. 
um, and they require a lot less maintenance. So mow height of five to six inches, three times a year. Sometimes we may go four, depending on what Mother Nature is doing. If it's really hot and we, we mow and it kind of, you know, puts it back a little bit, you might get away with three mowings or two mowings. But in general, three times a year, that's for us. Again, I was talking to somebody at, at break, any grass, native grasses especially, are happiest when they're not mowed. So if you can avoid mowing them, um, and you know, you, your expectation level is that, you can let them grow up, you know, that's, yeah, the mid-grass prairie will get two feet, you know. The, a lot of times you have the fluorescence, the seed head that's way above the, the leaf, but, uh, you know, two feet, something like that. Question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we haven't found that yet. I don't know if Don might be able to speak to that or one of our seed guys better than, than myself. Um, haven't seen any yet. A lot, a lot of the grasses actually do go to seed before we mow them on the, on the mid-grass prairie sites. Um, yeah, they had, I mean, the blue gramas seed, yeah, all the time, but, uh, I don't know, we can talk about that. Quick comment, good. Uh, so, the yeah. It, yeah, it really goes back. Yeah, thanks, Don. It goes back to what I was saying about they're happiest when they're not mowed, and we're kind of taking it out of that environment and um, changing it up, so to speak. So, question. Yeah, um, have we used milestone? What's the active ingredient in milestone? Triclopyr, I can't remember if it's the same. I don't know if we've done a side-by-side -side with Milestone, but we've compared it to other herbicides. We're gonna be doing a lot of that this year. We've already done a lot of pre-emergent stuff, which I wanted to talk about here. Let me keep rolling here and I'll, I will wanna answer your question. So maybe we can even talk afterward about that. So this weed control program here is one that we're really excited about, it's worked well. Um, and it's putting down pre-emergent herbicides um, in the beginning of the year. So product like Barricade, um, we've used Tenacity, which is uh, methotrione, I think, is the active ingredient. Um, trying to get the weeds before they come up. And we did a couple different applications this year with some different products. So we're trying some different things. But what we've seen so far, we're really excited about. Um, and again, that, that confront the application. So again, kind of look at that. Um, we're irrigating these areas. We continue to irrigate them to 12 inches because we want them to look good. There's obviously times of the year, like now when you're not irrigating them, but if you know, begins to get hot and dry, we'll put down some water. We budgeted for these areas. So we, we track our water usage in every single park. Um, we have an allocation to each park based on bluegrass, based on native grass, that each park technician has to abide by. So we wanna realize the benefits of these projects. So that's why we have um, an amount allocated. So the seven and a half acres at Keller and Watson, they get 12 inches of water. That's what's allocated to those areas for the growing season. Sometimes they use it, sometimes they don't. Yeah, that's on top of that's supplemental irrigation on top of what we get. Yep. So how much rainfall do you get in Denver? Pre oh, I'm sorry, annual precipitation in Denver. It's, I haven't thrown out a prize. No. How much? I'm sorry, 15? I don't know. I know in the springs we get 16, which I think we do get. Yeah. Um, Good to know. Most of it's during the growing season, so that's good. Obviously, we, we can realize the benefit from, you know, our winters are pretty dry, so during the growing seasons, when the majority of it comes, eight, I think eight, nine, ten inches, maybe more than that in the spring. Um, 
irrigation cycle. I mean, ideally, okay, and I know we can't do this in our parks. It's hard to get our park technicians to think this way, but you've heard the deep and infrequent type of irrigation. I mean, I would love for, you know, our technicians to just to get down a half inch water. I mean, most of the time when they're water, it's three tenths of an inch type of thing. But, you know, the idea again is to try to cycle and soak and push your water down and do it less to try to get that water and that root system to just um, work for that water and you have it in your, in your soil reservoir, so to speak. So a lot of times you don't have a water window that will allow that in our park system. Um, you know, it's based on an eight hour water window and um, you just can't get that kind of water down unless you water it on a separate evening. Are we okay going with some questions here? I've got, you know, some more, more material to go through. Go ahead. That that's right. That certainly helps. That the warm season grasses are are definitely have the a, a greater rooting um, capability than cool season grasses. Absolutely. Another question. Yeah, that's a good question. So you don't water it. Repeat the question. I'm sorry. What happens if you don't water the, you said warm season grasses or any of the conversions? I mean, the idea behind this is, you know, this is what happened to our parks district several years ago. I, you know, we can pull the plug and not water these and they'll, they'll survive is what I believe is going to happen. I mean, that's why we're doing it. You know, that, that word sustainable. Um, definitely. I think, you know, that's why we're doing this. Yep. All right, so long-term management for the wheat grass, okay? This is all cool season. Um, again, we're not doing so much of the all cool season. We're incorporating more warm season into it, but this is what we're kind of, you know, the application for this grass is more looking like the bluegrass type, um, you know, grass that we have in our parks. It's not the taller native-y looking, so we're gonna be maintaining this a little bit, um, more in terms of what we're putting in the inputs that we're putting into this into this native grass so we mow it bi-weekly okay we let it go mow it down to four inches so instead of mowing bluegrass every week we're mowing this bi-weekly to four inches okay and then it, it starts around may 1st it's going to mimic the bluegrass mowing cycle for our season um, so we are able to cut our maintenance costs in half in terms of mowing. Fertilizer, one to two times a year. Again, we're um, kind of going against the grain a little bit on what the native grass is, but we're finding grasses that can adapt to mowing, and those are the ones that we're trying to use here, okay? That's the idea. Um, we've used some uh, uh, Rocky Mountain fescue into this mix now. Um, side oats grama has done well but we're kind of you know introducing into this mix and blue grama this year to where we can mow this stuff um, to keep it looking good anyway here's uh, pretty much the application the the prescription for the maintenance long term you know we do one to two apps again of slow release fertilizer uh, overseeding this is a good question to someone asked earlier um, during break, it, you know, overseeding we only do typically the year after. Um, if there's some spots that are bare that need seeding, that's when we do it. But other other than that, we don't do any overseeding. I would say a lot of the projects don't need any overseeding. They're you're pretty much established um, after the first time. But there's been a few projects where we go back and we hit those spots that are bare that we overseed. So weed control again when you're going with just a cool season. There's a lot more options. There's, there's pretty much endless options, and that's kind of what Jared has written up here. Is just uh, a lot of lot more options when you're going with strictly cool season native grasses. And then our budget, irrigation budget for these sites is 16 inches. This is what we hold the technicians to. And um, again, keep them looking good. We'd love to, to do a field trip sometime down in the springs. To, you know, I've done a few of them over the years to show you some of these sites, what they would look like, you know, mowed like this, maintained like this. I think when you can get your eyes on them, you'll have a, a, 
I guess a greater appreciation to kind of what they what they look like. All right, so Frank, did you pass out the 3D glasses? This is where no. I, so here's kind of the walking you through the evolution of Wasson Park. So putting down some glyphosate here, and then seeding. You know, after we're all done seeding, we drag it. it looked like a dirt infield, really. There was no turf there, really. Like I said, it was mostly weeds. And then spring of the following year, and then, you know, a year later, roughly, you've got a, a great stand of, so here's an important point here. So April, greening up, what is that greening up? What would be greening up in um, April time? So that's, yeah, cool season grass. So this is one we use the prairie grass mix at. So there's buffalo in there. There's side oats grama, which is warm season. You know, there's blue grama. So obviously this is why I like mixing them. You've got your seasons covered. I mean, this looks good in April and it looks good midsummer because the warm season grasses come in and they're flourishing. Some of the cool grass, you know, some of our wheat grass projects, you know, they, they struggle in the summer sometimes. I mean, when it gets hot and dry and you're putting 16 inches of water on, but that's okay. We're, we're fine with that. Question. How would this look a year later, next season or two? Is it going to green up the same way? Yeah. Yep. This site really looked good this spring. I mean, in terms of you talking to the early. <coughs> Yeah, this is really early. Um, again, April, I don't know when in April this was. Could have been, from the looks of it, it was early. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll, look, it'll look like that. Yeah. yeah. Unless you go with a strictly a cool season, you know, you're not going to have that. Or you will have that. So there's, there's what it looks like about a year later. Um, and then here's Keller Park. Same kind of thing. Uh, you know, a year later established better than I was expecting just because of some of the wheat pressure that that was there and didn't have our our slurry so to speak uh, at that point but uh, did well so here's some of the conversion costs that I think are important you know dollars and cents a lot of times HOA presidents or supervisors or whoever want to see what, what's the cost what's the payback those types of things um, so conversion projects for the big sites, okay? Um, again, we did some of this in-house, so this might be skewed if you're using all contract labor. Um, we did contract out the glyphosate. Actually, most of this we did contract out. Um, so these are the costs. Very, very inexpensive, obviously. When you look at the price per acre, $2,380, you know, roughly 20, we'll say $2,500 for the for the cost of these projects. Um, when you expand that out over seven and a half acres, it's very, very cost effective. Maintenance costs. So here's where the rubber meets the road. When you look at this mid grass prairie at these sites, again, when you look at the cost, you know, you look at the mowing costs, we were mowing easier contract mode, you know, 32 times a year of the bluegrass compared to three times for the native grass you know, you're going to have a huge savings. We pay $200 an acre to, to, to mow our, our bluegrass. And then pretty much if you go down the line. So the two big areas, our water is expensive in Colorado Springs. That's why Frank left. No. Almost a, a, a penny a gallon so we pay. And I know on, just from being in the business, we're one of the highest on the front range uh, down in Colorado Springs, if not – the highest. There might be one or two others. Aurora's up there, I know. Question. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, he's talking about capital costs and costs that are, are associated with, with this. Now, again, a lot of this was contract labor. So we just paid a contractor to come in and apply the glyphosate. So 
you know, I would assume capital costs are in there in that. Yeah, well, we do. No, this is contract. Everything's contract mode. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right, maintenance costs again. When you look at this, these are real numbers. I mean, this is what we're we're able to save, you know, on this site when you apply it to maintain it as bluegrass to what it's now being maintained as as a midgrass prairie. Um, you know, obviously the payback is is crazy. It's fast. It's um, between the the maintenance. I think it's important to understand even if you don't have high water costs or free water. I know some parks districts get a very, you know, the maintenance alone can save you money. And I'll show you even the, the wheatgrass one here next. So payback is, is quick. And again, here's a more expensive, more capital intensive projects that, you know, for you to look at as well. Barnes median and, and the briar gate. So again, we had to go in and physically remove the soil. Conversion costs for these. You know, it's about 10 times the, the price of per acre. Again, smaller area, so all your capital costs aren't being spread out over seven acres, they're a half an acre. So the smaller the area, the obviously the slower it's gonna be in terms of recouping your costs, and that's obvious for obvious reasons. Question? We have, yeah, we have. Um, we just, we're getting ready to do another median. We haven't really seen um, an impact yet for some of the wheat grasses that we've put on there. And I don't know this for sure, but I would assume they're more salt tolerant. Um, we've taken a few soil tests and they're elevated levels of salt, but not like to the point where it's detrimental to, you know, turf grass or, you know, grass. So, so far we're all right. Yeah. All right, so maintenance costs, cost benefit. Again, you know, I think even on a small project, three years is a, is a great payback. And again, to me, you don't do all these, you don't do these projects just for the payback. You do it because it, to me, it's the right thing to be doing. Um, I think that's really important as well, just to have that understanding that, yeah, payback is great, and I think that's a, a big part, especially if you're trying to sell this maybe to um, a supervisor or something like that. But in our climate, um, in our environment in Colorado, you know, this is the right thing in a lot of applications. Question? Yeah, I would say this one, well, the wheatgrass one is very close. I mean, it's going to be the same because it's 16. Well, actually, I'll show you here in just a minute. So here's a slide of a project that uh, Jared did last year, um, about a two-acre site in, in kind of the downtown area of Colorado Springs. Um, wheatgrass, well, so you had, yeah, this is one that we use side oats, um, Rocky Mountain fescue, and uh, a couple different wheat grasses in, and again, it's seeded probably what was it, Jared? Late August or mid, maybe early August. I can't. And so this is. What kind of challenges do those areas have for irrigation design in terms of water resources? Yeah. Were there you know, fifty percent change zones or hundred percent of them? Or yeah, good question. So his question is about what kind of challenges did we have here for irrigation um, design? And it's kind of funny because this this park received a brand new irrigation system. It needed it. It was actually a, like abandoned two years ago. This site is mostly weeds. There is some bluegrass hanging on. You can kind of see it in the middle there. But to answer your question probably more accurately, I mean, it varies from site to site. I mean, it's, some of it is changing out. Uh, you know, four inch heads, the pop-ups, and a lot of it is the rezoning, trying to get those, those borders, you know, if, you're, if your zones are running across your sidewalk and your conversions areas here, to rezone it to where you're able to maximize, you know, your water savings in those areas. So anyway, here's the, the process. This is everything. So we just got done aerating it, um, contracted out. And then 
I would guess this was, you know, this was late last year. I drove by this site this March. In fact, I've got some pictures on my phone. It didn't look too much different than this picture. <laughs> it was really green. So, um, again, advantage to using mostly cool season. You walk in there, there's some side oats, and you can see it in there. It's dormant still, and that'll kick in um, starting here pretty quick. So, question. That's about two months, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Are you running drip irrigation for the trees? Or are they running? You know, that's a good question. We did not run drip irrigation. So, again, this site, I would say, didn't receive hardly any water for quite a while, to be honest with you. It was uh, a lot of weeds. We looked at the trees that were there. We have our forester involved as well and get his input on stuff. And I think we're. When you look at most of the sites that we convert, they reduce to probably 16, 18, 20 inches of water. We typically don't run supplemental irrigation to those sites. Yeah. Did you have a question, man? It's mulch, actually. Mulch, yeah. So the technician did a great job. You know, there's places you just don't want to grow grass. You put in some edging. It looks really nice. It was really a great project for us. And then here's the other, another section of the park. Again, kind of the before, and then the, the kill of it, and then again, maybe eight, 10 weeks after. Um, so, I'm sorry, using, um, yeah, we've got a lot of rotary nozzles. We've gone to almost, in smaller parks like that, we've gone almost exclusively to the rotary nozzles. Yeah, we love them. Um, for sure. So what's next? So this is important. I'm kind of wrapping up here. Um, this is on Jared's performance plan this year. So <laughs> to take this to the next level, what does that mean? Well, we, I, I, I want to finish. I feel like we need to put some signage out on some of these areas so citizens can see you know, someone coming through the park knows what's going on. I mean, we've got our story out in a lot of ways, but at the park itself, we'd like to do a better job with that, trying to get our, our signage out there. Um, a couple of the large sites um, where it makes sense, Wasson Park and Keller, you know, having a nice meandering path through some of these larger areas with some of that interpretive signage, I think would go a long ways in just helping our situation and our cause. And um, again, I'm inviting the community in to, to really enjoy some of these areas that we're doing. I get questions about wildflowers. Um, I love the idea of wildflowers, but as we probably know, wildflowers and um, herbicides don't mix very well, and um, we haven't really done any of that. I think if you're looking at a site that's truly a native site that you don't really you don't mind converting over to a native grass and have very minimal, minimal maintenance, you know, wildflowers might be a great fit for that type of um, situation. So. All right, so just wrapping up, it's been awesome to see kind of our whole culture in our parks department. You know, our new park design is going towards this whole idea of implementing more native grass, our big park on the north side that opened up last year. You know, what used to be, you know, this would probably be a 20 acre bluegrass park is now, at, you know, two and a half acres, some synthetic turf obviously in there, but a lot of native grasses and they've done pretty well. Jared's working with them this year to get them, some of them overseeded. This was really in the contractor's hands, but just to kind of show, I think this is another aspect. Um, I was talking to a designer at break as well, trying to introduce these native grasses into our new, new design developments in our projects is really, really important. Lessons learned. Um, I mentioned this, you know, to me, this is this is the the main uh, uh, point that I'd, I'd say important point that I'd like to emphasize, and that to be successful, you've got to find someone to really own these projects who's not going to fail. You know, have that mentality of you know what I'm going to do whatever it takes to make these um, projects succeed. So I call it passion. Um, having that passion to succeed, do it well, 
and uh, kind of a never say die attitude. A variety of techniques, like I said, you know, we anyway, a lot of different ways to get the seed down. You know, the idea is getting it into the soil to a quarter, half inch, and covering up where you need to. But, um, you know, there's not one prescriptive way of giving you some ideas and ways that we do it. But you can experiment and come up with some of your own uh, ways of doing it. Great alternative to bluegrass, absolutely. Cost effective, attractive. I mean, these are some of the most attractive grasses we have. Love, again, the, the opportunity to do a field trip maybe this summer and go look at some of these sites. They're very attractive. Um, they do require an intentional customized maintenance plan to be successful long term. Okay, that's we covered some of that. Education awareness critical for long-term success. Again, you know, telling your story, getting information out there, why you're doing it, and savings benefits, and under, helping them understand native grasses aren't bluegrass, right? They're a different kind of grass, um, things like that. And then obviously I believe, well, they are. They're a water conserving, you know, certainly a water conserving option. and. I think a very good landscape option for our environment and our community. Um, so that's, that's it. This is a, a document that I wanted to make reference to earlier that I, I brought a hard copy here, but this is, this is um, accessible online that you can go here and, and dial it up. This has been huge help to me. I've, if you look at this, it's got, coffee and crumbs and all kind of stuff smashed in here. I've, I've used this a lot. Thank them a bunch for that. But that's a great, great document for helping outlining what I just kind of did in, in some different uh, formats as well or different applications. So, and that's what I have. Any questions? I'm here to stay as long as we need to and answer questions. And so feel free to, if you have to go, go ahead and head out. She has a question. Yeah, so again, our, I would say our go-to mix now has warm and cool season in it. And it does vary some depending on which warm season grass that you put in it. Um, so blue grama is one that we've stayed away from just because it is more susceptible um, to some of them. But we're going to try it this year. So Jared has a couple. He could probably set you up with that, um, a prescription for, for your application. Any other questions? Good. As far as mowing, like the four inch height is pretty much a normal commercial mower, but what are you using or contractor using for the six and taller? Yeah. So what are we using for mowing at six inches and taller? So we leave that up to the contractor to figure out. I mean, they've used, uh, you know, the big wide boom decks. One guy had to kind of alter what he did. He welded on some stuff and um, bush hog, which would not be our first, choice but um that's been used the flail mower um was used um actually some of the the z mower actually i think was one that they used so a um, couple different mowers and nothing specific so to speak that we can reference so yeah go ahead i'm trying to develop a wildlife habitat and uh, i'm concerned about chemicals uh-huh uh, native grasses apparently will support insects that are beneficial and uh, not using the chemicals, is that going to complicate the establishment of the native grass? You know, right. Uh, yes, it will. The question was about trying to be, you know, cognizant, uh, sensitive to environmental factors and plant or um, insect life and things like that and using chemicals. And um, absolutely, I mean, chemicals have helped us. Obviously, when you look at some of the pictures and our success, that's been aided by the use of, of chemicals, being able to control the weeds. Um, the couple of projects where we didn't use chemicals, it was, it was tremendous the amount of weeds that came in. When you think about what we're doing, disrupting the soil and pulling dirt up and all these weed seeds that are in there that have been dormant, I mean, it's, it's, it's an infusion of weeds, um, typically in our sites. Um, so... 
question related to that, yes, we wouldn't have near the success that we, we are having with without chemicals. So, yeah. What about uh, soil amendments like rock dust? Yeah, like I mentioned, we have not used any soil amendments at all for anything that we've done. And I'm not familiar with with we call it rock dust. Oh, it's Huh. I'm not familiar with it. And like I said, one of the beauties that, that we have seen with native grasses is, you know, they're very adaptable to, to cruddy soils. And if we can minimize costs that go into the project and be successful, I think that's, that's what we're trying to do. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, that website um, that I had up there, or was there was that a web? No, it wasn't a website, was it? If you Google uh, this right here, sustainable landscape conversion and design, it, it comes up. Um, yeah, right there. If you Google that, that I've done it often to send people and stuff, it, it comes up. I think I have it listed also on my, in this paper that I put together. It's on here. Um, so yeah, any other questions? Yeah, I mean, we, as you could imagine, we've, after doing 40 projects, we've done, I mean, you have two, uh, two extremes, the clay and the sand, and then a few lucky spots, you have some, you know, what I'd call loam soil. I'm glad you brought this up. So sand, sandy soils tend to be a lot more of a challenge um, for native grasses, establishing when you have a very, very sandy soil, like we do on the north side of the springs, your options are, are uh, limited, I guess. Um, they tend to be grasses that, that are taller as well, that do well in that application. Um, that might be one where you would want to include some soil amendment, but, you know, Blue Grama has done exceptionally well on, on sandy soils. We do have a couple we have a mix this year that I think will do very well on sandy soil. So we're clay soils, a lot more options that you have, I believe, to, to establish a wider variety of, of native grasses. Um, sandy soils tend to be a, a, a little bit more of a challenge. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But. Okay. Well, yeah, no, we don't have any uh, strictly warm season stands. All of our all of our um, projects have either been cool season or warm and cool season. So we don't have uh, we've purposely stayed away from that. I think although you can realize a lot more cost savings, I or more cost savings, I should say just because you have a shorter growing season and you know they're a lot more uh you're able to, to keep them going with less water type of thing but yeah yeah that's another problem with just warm season dormant for quite a while where the cool seasons are coming on question I get a lot of calls from HOAs and homeowners looking to convert. And so I have I can start a list over here. If you're in the northern Colorado area, if you want to get your name on a list, I can hand that list out. Okay. So Thank you. Please stop and see me. All right. Do we have to end? I'm, I'll go as long as we want. Are we okay, Frank? Okay. Question here. I think so. Yeah, we try to go over it as much as we can. I mean, being realistic about it, three or four passes, I think, is pretty much what we average. Depends on the site, especially if you can't get like a, a cedar on those areas, like that last project that, that Jared showed the last or that he did this last year. There's some tight areas where you can't get a cedar, and we really try to chew up those areas with, with an aerator just so we have a spot for the seed to go. So, 
yeah, there is. I believe there's an advantage going over it as much as you can. Yeah. Question. Um, do you have to worry if you don't mow and have a taller grass? Do you have to plan like the tire to be big in the your design? We haven't. Um, we've gotten a few email concerns. I mean, it's it's green. It's we typically let it go up probably 12 inches, um, 18 inches. It hasn't been part of our design. Again, it's it's very much a urban type setting. Um, to answer your question, no. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, no such thing, right? If you don't mow these things and they get hot. Yeah. I live in this spring. What's your rattlesnake problem? So Can you repeat the question. If we, if we don't mow these, uh, some of these the mid grass prairie ones, I would say, if we don't mow them, would it would it create a problem for critters like snakes? Probably. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The sites that we have them in, I would say no. I mean, you know, rattlesnakes tend to like rocky areas you know these are very much again when you look at the setting they're rural in the neighborhood and kind of away from any type of rock yeah garden of god you got issues there yeah any other i would like any other i want to make sure i get people i haven't spoken any go ahead i know you kind of alluded to it it's kind of impacted the trees which are kind of the high water yeah so Im impact the trees i've mentioned it um hard to know exactly again when you look at the state of what happened in our parks district back in seven eight nine and ten I mean, water was we went from 24 inches to 10 to 12 inches and you know we started we kind of slowly came back we saw some serious impact to trees from that in our downtown medians you know when we had we see the result of a tree several years later. So it's hard to tell the exact impact, but to be perfectly honest, we haven't seen a huge impact from, from these conversions directly related to conversion, something that wasn't happening already when we got there um, from previous, you know, environmental stresses, nothing we can say that I don't think that it uh, is directly related to the conversion. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, for giving the time to do yeah. this project to us. But I'm wondering, you had to go a little bit faster than I was able to keep up with in terms of getting some really useful information out of this PowerPoint mm -hmm. here. What would be the easiest way to access this information following the presentation? Okay, good question. So what's the best way to access this information? I'm happy to share this with whoever. You've got my contact information. I've got business cards up there. I, print out a PDF or send you a PDF and go that route. So, so yeah, yep. If anybody wants a copy of this, I'm happy to, for, again, for a small fee. Um, no. Yeah. yeah, webinar. We're gonna save this web. Yes, we're saving the webinar. We're gonna post it on our website and send out a link to everybody who registered. And so you'll be able to retrieve that and then we'll give a PDF of Eric's handout as well. So you should be able to have that electronically as well as to review the webinar too. Go ahead, over here. Did you have a question? No, I, okay, I'll get a quick question on uh, medians. I know this is probably a little bit out of what's covered today, but any ideas and suggestions on how to convert or improve the median between the two streets to cut down on waste of water? Uh, one comment you made was maybe go to the rotary nozzles what, what type of vegetation's on there now? I mean, bluegrass. bluegrass. How, how wide? How how wide is it roughly? Is it pretty narrow? Yeah, you know, again, the the idea behind this presentation is, you know, native grasses I think are a good fit in certain applications. You know, you know, landscape treatment applications. They're not. Would I use a native grass there? That would be, I'd have to see it to see if that would be a good fit or not. But when you start getting narrower, to me, those are landscape areas, either better for like a landscape bed with some plants, um, with some rock mulch or wood mulch versus 
something like a native grass, but it would be hard. That's one of those in between spots, I would say. So, so rotary nozzles are, you know, again, cutting out the grass and going with more of a drip application with, with a plant bed or trees and shrubs and that type of setting. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. I forgot to mention this. So she asked, she's part of an HOA, is there any type of rebates or grants or things like that that are out there to help with this process? So yes, but I'm, it depends on your area. Colorado Springs, our, our water purveyor has a native grass rebate program. So they are paying, you know, folks to, to convert their grass to native grass in the, in the right application. So I can't speak to where your, you know, your location is. Frank might have some more information on this, but I do know there are rebates and it's, it's becoming more popular, the idea of rebates from water purveyors. Right. So we have a 50% matching grant from five to up to $15,000. We're in our first year of grant projects. We'll be releasing next year's application likely around November 1st. It's for anybody in Northern Service Territory and it does have some constraints. You have to have a project submitted to your water provider and getting approval from that municipality. And there's some other elements involved with it, like a good location for education, signage requirements, but we'd be happy to talk to you about that we have uh, the requirement to go and visit your site and make sure it's a good candidate and then we can help with the next steps too. So yes, the grants are available from us. We've received a request for a list of capable contractors in the past. We don't currently have a list like that. What we do is refer people to the Find a Pro website on WaterSense or ALCC's website, the Association of Landscape Contractors of Colorado. For folks who've been through term training, we might put together a list in the future, but that's, that's a difficult thing to figure out what to include. All right, one more question, then I'll kind of... Yeah, that's a good question. So am I aware of any HOAs that have been successful with uh, with the conversion project? And I'm trying to think right off the top of my head, and I, I don't know that many HOA projects, so um, not off the top of my head, I can't. Maybe some other people can speak to it. Yes. Okay. Yep, good. I'll we'll, stick around. Go ahead, Frank. We'll have some projects that we're we're working with under under the underway this year that are our grant recipients doing conversions. So hopefully we can turn those into successful case studies and showcase those HOA results. All right, I think I'll well go ahead. Huh. You don't have to cut it. Mosses, huh? Mosses. I'd like okay, to we're gonna we're gonna stop it here. We have one question online. Uh, if you don't mind, Eric, that question yeah. was posed about if you have a dedicated crew assigned to these, and then we're gonna move to the outside portion. So did this project have a dedicated crew assigned to it? How did your organization organize your staff to complete uh, this work? So did talk a little bit about it. So we 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 kind of work together. Jared will use some of the staff at, at the park location to use some of their equipment sometimes to do uh, these projects. A lot of times we'll contract 
again, aspects of the project out, whether it's uh, the seating part, we have a good seating contractor that we've got comfortable using, does a really good job. So we kind of look at the project, see what it's gonna entail, look at what, what resources we can use in-house, in -house, so to speak, and then what, what uh, resources we'll need coming from the outside. But it's usually a kind of a ham and egg type thing. We use some inside, some outside sources, so. Okay. Um, with that, I think what we can do is, is finish up in here. I'd ask you to take some food and drink with you. As you head downstairs, we'd like you to scan your badge out and then you can just recycle that. So just, you'll see a little thing that says sign out and we'll help you through that. And then we can head outside. If, if you'd like to see some of these stands we have here on site, Eric can walk over and you can take a look at what those look like, at least on our campus. Thank you everybody for coming today. And there's materials in the back if you want to take any home. Oh, yeah.